podcast addict and podcast chaser. Sorry for you guys over there on Spreaker. Um, I just realized I did not unmute. Dang it. Something always has to happen. Like the heat today, I cannot stand it. It's terrible. Um, so yeah, if you don't mind, mosey on over to our YouTube, which is under We Are Paradox Media. Please subscribe, like any video that you've listened to or watched, and leave us a comment. Good, bad, ugly. We don't care. We just want to hear from you and know what you think of the show. Also, leave us any comments as far as what future guests you would like to have on. Um, you can also email me at weareparadoxmedia at gmail.com and let me know there personally. I don't know about you guys, but this earth heating up is crazy. Um, my second oldest daughter, Nova, has been telling people, you don't like how hot it is this summer? Well, you better enjoy it because this is the coolest the summer is going to be ever. Seriously, it is so hot. I had my fan going. It's a dollar store fan. And it's just blowing around the hot air, so I'm basically in a heated room with a little breeze in my face. I can't do it during the show because, yeah, it just doesn't work out like that. It's not good. I wish I had a fan like those lovely ladies back in the Baptist church, churches and such. Um, but yeah, I have this little, little ditty in my hair. I'm going to take that down because it's just not really working out for me. So, for story time this evening, we are doing E. Randall Floyd's book, The Hundred, The World's Hundred Greatest Mysteries, Strange Secrets of the Past Revealed. It's been an amazing book. This is, uh, yet again, a book that I got from my grandpapa, my grandpa Cookie. And, um, yeah, I inherited some of his books. The one that I really wanted was, uh, the one about the Philadelphia Project. A lot of people don't believe that that happened. I truly do. My grandpa was a member of the Navy, and um, he believed in that too. Come to find out after he passed away, he actually had a hardcore belief in the paranormal. And I believe it was the year before he passed away, he, he asked me about it because he knew that I ran a paranormal group, Four Corners Paranormal Investigations. And, and he's like, do you really believe in that stuff? Hey, Chris Garcia. And I said, yeah, Grandpa, I do. Like, not only due to the paranormal experiences that I had throughout my childhood and beyond, which is why I still have sleep issues, which is why I still have these lovely bags of luggage under my eyeballs. But um, I do believe in the paranormal and, and um, told them a few stories about different people that had passed and different members that they had known of their family or even friends that came to see them like right before they passed and I do believe that people are waiting for us on the other side to get through. If you guys hear any sound issues let me know um, and I'm willing to fix that. These look kind of low so let me know is it too low? Is it echoing? Um, yeah this is pretty interesting. Let me turn these off over here because it seems I'm bouncing on on that but hmm interesting so yeah let me know uh in the chat am i am i bouncing am i echoing what is happening here all right so let's get to the book even though there's nobody in here oh, i feel so lonely oh and hot Ooh, tea shame so you know person number one over here I see you. You're watching the thing. Um, is the sound okay? If it's not, please let me know so I can fix it. Oh, yeah. So this one, uh, this chapter is called The Little People. Once upon a time, long before towns and highways, fairies and elves ruled the gloomy forest and mist shrouded crags of old Europe. Humans wisely avoided these haunted domains especially as twilight floated and danced among the hidden glens and remote moors. But as time passed and civilization pressed deeper into the fairy kingdom, people forgot about the little people, like the dragons and witches of old. Fairies and elves remained alive only in myth and song. Then, in 1917, the world was shocked when two young English girls reported that they had discovered a troop of friendly sprites living in the woods near their home, 
in the Yorkshire village of uh, Cottingley. One of the girls, 15-year-old Elsie Wright, even took photographs of the little people to prove their existence. I'm sorry, guys. This is getting to me. The photographs, along with the girls' accounts of the discovery, made the front page of the newspapers in London, New York, Frankfurt, and elsewhere. None other than Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of the supremely rational detective Sherlock Holmes, accepted the story. Sir Arthur speculated at length on how certain people could tune in on a race of beings, constructed in material which threw out shorter or longer vibrations. In a 1922 book, The Coming of the Fairies, Sir Arthur wrote that the fairy population was as numerous as the human race and is only separated from ourselves by some difference of these vibrations. Okay, so that sounds good. I just had to check the Facebook really quick to see how that sounded. I'm sorry, I'm feeling a bit, a bit clamped. Just kidding. I'm feeling a bit melty. Remember when I did that last summer and it was a really shitty roll of paper towels that left really funny little paper towel blots all over my face? Sir Arthur speculated at length on how certain people could tune in on a race of beings constructed in material which threw out shorter or longer vibrations. In 1922, a book, The Coming of the Fairies, Sir Arthur wrote that the fairy population was as numerous as the human race and is only separated from ourselves by some difference of these vibrations. Five years before the uh, Cottingley incident, let me check my thing here really quick, make sure I'm bouncing. Am I bouncing? Yes, I am. Is it too loud? Let me know if it's too loud. Um, let me see if I can turn this down because it does seem like it's pretty loud. Is that better? No, let's go down a little bit more. Okay, that looks better. Let's go with that. Um, can I have a fanboy in my office that can wave a fan at me the whole time? Or a fangirl even, you know, I'm not sexist. Anyone that's willing to wave air at me would be great. Five years before the Cotting Lee incident, the prestigious Yale Review published an article that claimed to substantiate the existence of fairies and elves. Titled The Historical Existence of Fairies, the paper correlated the legends of fairies in oral tradition with ethnological evidence and archaeological artifacts. The report concluded that fairies represent the last traditional memories of a historical race. Sorry, this man is heavy. I don't know how lions do it in Africa. The report concluded that fairies represent the last traditional memories of a historical race. Some scholars suggest that fairies and fairy stories originated as old as wives' tales, a way for frustrated women to surreptitiously rebel against the constraints placed on them by their restrictive society. Most of the earliest tales from France and Germany were dark and gruesome, not intended for children at all. Just like a lot of fairy tales, like um, Cinderella and all these other stories that um, Disney has taken part in. These are not for children. Um, the Brothers Grimm, when they first came out. Sorry guys. I feel like liquid, liquid hot magma. But yes, these stories were very gruesome and then we re-portrayed them to be made for children. So they became less gruesome as time went on, but they originated as very, very gruesome, very gruesome indeed. Some scholars suggest that fairy stories originated as old as wives' tales, a way for frustrated women to, I just read this, surreptitiously rebel against the constraints placed on them by their restrictive society. 
Most of the earliest tales from France and Germany were dark and gruesome, not intended for children at all. Their so-called women's stories were passed down orally by mothers and grandmothers who worked long and hard at boring, thankless tasks like sewing, spinning, maintaining the hearth, and child rearing. It was a way to pass the time and at the same time transfer gossip and wisdom at the same time. Eventually, these darkly brooding tales about man-eating fairy folk, seductive sprites of the forest, and other frightening themes were discovered by writers and artists. The Grimm brothers, Charles Perrault and Hans Christian Andersen, and other literary figures saw social benefit in the old tales. After carefully toning them down to suit younger audiences, they put them down on paper and became rich. Fairies, also known as green men, good folk, elves, pixies, or gnomes, remain one of the most fanciful races in mythology and literature. They are featured in myths from early Norsemen, Celts, Romans, as well as in medieval French, English, Irish, and Scottish tales. Chaucer and Shakespeare wrote about these shimmering creatures of the forest, as did many other literary figures. Who or what were these fairies? How was it that so many people accepted their existence for so long? Sorry, I got sweat trying to drip into my eye. I could feel it coming. Stories about fairies, elves, dwarfs, sprites, and other little people were common in early times, especially in the remote wilds of Western Europe and the British Isles. These wee folk were believed to inhabit the meadows and shadowy woodlands of the countryside, occasionally favoriting or cavorting with mortals. Folklorists and anthropologists theorize the original fairies were members of conquered races who took to the hills and forests to escape persecution by humans. It has also been suggested that fairies were remnants of the old gods and spirits displaced by Christianity. Some writers have opined that the fairy faith is all that remains of an ancient cult of the dead, pointing to stories that the dead sometime appear in the company of fairies. Robert Kirk, author of The Secret Commonwealth, 1691, said fairies lived in a middle kingdom between men and angels, with bodies somewhat of the nature of a condensed cloud. Mortals with second sight can sometimes see these elusive creatures, Kirk explained. Some investigators claim that the fairies of old were actually aliens in disguise. One popular British writer of the paranormal has reported claims of fairy abductions that are remarkably similar to UFO abduction tells. So I haven't heard that as far as adults, but like, um, there was one story that I read where a child was born and the father was just like, I don't know, he just felt super separated. Sorry, I'm trying to get this sweaty teeth off me, but the child that he felt super separated from and he just felt like not connected to this child. And then um, they brought the child home and then the child was taken out. It was probably in this book that I read this, but I'm um, taken out into the woods because the father's like, hey, let me give you a break. Um, let me take this child out for a walk in the woods and you take a nap or whatever. Take a break from your womanly duties. And then he left the child in the shire. And then the these fae or goblins or whatever the heck it was took the child and he came back and the child was gone and he was just like in a panic like what am i gonna do my wife's gonna think i murdered it or whatever and then eventually uh he found the child again and the child was actually um the original child so yeah that was different because the other child would just cry and cry and cry and it was such a mess but yeah pretty pretty uh, interesting some investigators claim that fairies of old, okay, already read that, 
Another new theory links elves and fairies with a rare genetic anomaly known as Williams syndrome. First described in 1961, this rare disorder produces cardiovascular problems such as heart murmurs, subnormal intelligence, and an acute sensitivity to sound. The most striking feature, however, is the physical appearance of victims, stunted with childlike faces, small turned noses, oval ears, and broad mouths with full lips and small chin. In short, they look like the description of traditional elves. The word elf has become a generic term for diverse groups of little people that have actually been separated into species, families, and genre. There are pixies, hobgoblins, sippy, redcaps, fees, sprites, perchgrims, wood trolls, lutons, and these are to name a few. This is interesting because um, I don't know a lot of these terms. According to researcher Carol B. Fleming, classifications of little people are made in terms of their relationships to mortals. Little elves are good-natured and helpful, while dark elves are ill-tempered, live underground, and cause continual trouble. A large, unpredictable group called dusky elves falls in between, Fleming said. All little people possess magical powers, including the ability to become invisible. I've witnessed this, I'll tell you right after we finish this. They vary from ant or thumb size to about four feet in height. Many prefer to wear red and green, the colors of magic. Mischievous little people have been blamed for everything from storms to illness to souring of milk. Wherever a person went missing, it was usually the work of lamias, horrible, fire-breathing monsters that could assume human form to trick and seduce unwary travelers. A few modern scholars embrace the existence of fairies and their twilight kin. W.Y. Evans Wintz, author of The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, is an exception. The British scientist spent most of his life documenting oral traditions of the fairy realm, ranging from the Far East to the Americas. We can postulate scientifically on the showing of the data of physical research, the existence of true fairies, Dr. Evans once concluded. And what about Elsie Wright's amazing fairy photos? Controversy continued to swirl until 1983, when cousin Francis Griffiths messed up. The winged sprites in the photographs that had been taken with her father's box camera were nothing more than cleverly disguised paper cutouts stuck in place by hat pins. Although the photos were fakes, Miss Griffiths insisted that the fairies she and her cousin Elsie played with in the garden that day in 1917 were very real. So for me, um, okay, so I've had experience with spirits, goblins, the devil, um, never experienced with fairies. Uh, later on in my life, when I was about 16, I saw little people and they were about 12 to 14 inches high. And um, so I'm sitting here on Wildcat Canyon Road in Paris, Paris, Arkansas. And um, I can't sleep. I've always had issues sleeping due to my paranormal background. And all of a sudden I hear movement. I hear someone talking and I'm wondering what the heck is going on. And I'm waiting for my sister to come out because she'd go to bed with her husband because he would be upset about her staying up late as mine is as well with my staying up late. I can't help it. That's how I was raised and born and, and grew to be an adult. Um, but yeah, I heard this noise. So I'm like, yeah, she's going to come out. She's going to play Scrabble with me. And then all of a sudden I see this little person and 
it was in my sister's kitchen so there's the sink and stuff over here there's a little uh, cabinet over here there's about 12 to 13 inches between the cabinet and another nook that is glass and you could put cups or dishes or whatever you want in there it was a little person and um, right then automatically where did all our socks go and other missing clothing it was the little people but it was one guy and he's He's in coveralls, no shirt. He's like, bang, 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 come along. And he goes to the end of that shelf and he sits and he starts kicking his legs. Hey, Rob. Good to see you. But he starts kicking his legs and he's just like, da, 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 da. Now, I can't understand little people, but he's jabbering away and he's just sitting there kicking his legs. And all of a sudden his counterpart, which looked like, um, he wasn't wearing coveralls with no shirt like this other one was. Like, this one was totally heelbilly style. The other one was wearing a long sleeve, looked like long john shirt, like long john material, and pants. And this other one comes running up behind him and pushes him off the shelf. Luckily, this guy is pretty quick on his feet or his butt because he was sitting on his butt. When he flipped around, grabbed onto the side of the shelf, and pull himself back up and then they're like fighting back and forth and I'm like this is the perfect time for me to get up and go out there and see what the fuck is really going on because I cannot believe my eyes that I'm seeing these little people 12 to 14 inches tall wearing clothes and jibber jabbering back and forth and fighting and, and whatnot and I get up so I lose sight of them when I get up because I'm laying down I get up I lose sight because of the wall and I go in there and they're gone they're gone like where the hell did they go and then another thing as far as fairies running four corners paranormal investigations we had a woman that lived in forest lakes and she had random crazy shit happening in her house um things being taken things being thrown at her her head everything um things being written on her ceiling where her child cannot reach in lipstick and things like that. And so we met with her, not in her house, because we don't want these entities to know what's going on. I'm sorry, like, I'm so kind of, like, messed up because it's so sweaty here. But anyways, so we meet with her at the patio in Ignacio, which is far from where she lives in Forest Lakes. And she's telling us all these stories, etc. And... That's why I like diversity, because I know certain things, but other girls in my group automatically were like, yep, those are fairies, and I'm like, what? Fairies actually exist? Like, I'm Irish, uh, mostly European, a little bit African, um, a little topic Egyptian, but they knew about fairies, they knew how to deal with them, and I'm like, seriously? I'm, I'm listening, I'm paying attention, but, um, so they moved into this place. A lot of trees and brush and stuff were hacked down in order for this house to be put there. So, of course, the Fae were very pissed off. You don't believe in Fae? Hey, I know in Ireland they're there, but here? And, um, so what they were told was what she was told was put out an offering or plant flowers so plant flowers was the first step let's plant things in a circle because fairy circles sorry i got a little bit of hiccups all of a sudden but plant flowers or shrubs or you know whatever like honeysuckle different pretty flowers like petunias and stuff that you can eat etc put those in a circle and you know redo this area that was cut down and then take out a plate with toast honey and other things to appease these spirits i'm like seriously so you can appease fairies and they're like yeah they like sweet stuff so honey and then butter and toast and put some tea out there etc and cool it was cool um but come to find out sorry i'm, I'm going on about this so long but this little girl is part fae, which can happen. Um, so yeah, uh, not only 
were the fairies in on this and like i said things were thrown stuff like that guess what very large armoires and and different things like that were thrown and knocked over like the whole place was being trashed every night some of the stuff i think was the little girl going along with the fairy she's like oh what do i do this and this and that and that so he was helping write some things but the things on the ceiling being written armoires and other heavy things she could not even knock over were being knocked over um it was pretty intense so i was so grateful as far as how different the members of our group was that we were able to still help this woman and um generally when we help people whether we're cleansing their house or we're giving them different things to do she never contacted us again so i'm pretty sure the things we asked her to do worked and helped for her to have peaceful place for her and her her daughter thank goodness rob also uh since you're watching can you let me know is it echoey i just want to make sure the sound is okay so we're going to move on to the next chapter Here, there be dragons. One of the most popular tourist attractions in the Austrian city of Klingenfurt is an imposing stone monument that depicts a naked warrior slaying a winged fire-breathing monster. But in 1590, the monument was inspired by the finding of a dragon skull in a nearby cave. The skull was displayed in the town hall until modern scientists identified it as a woolly rhinoceros. But legends die hard in this remote region of the Alps. According to tradition, horrible flame-throwing dragons once lurked among the gloomy crags and bogs, guarding treasures and terrorizing the local population. Even today, there are those who believe dragons still roam the world. You know, pterodactyl and other things do. Dragons are more than just legendary creatures of old, says Dr. Joachim Dietrich, a professor of anthropology at the University of Innsbruck. Too many clues have been found suggesting that they might still exist in certain protected areas of Europe, Africa, and Asia. Since earliest times, dragons have figured prominently in folklore. The ancient Mesopotamians were the first to tell stories about water dragons. 5,000 years ago, the stories about Hold on. I feel like the music is too loud. Is it too loud? I'm gonna turn it down a smidge. Let me know if that's better. The ancient Mesopotamians were the first to tell stories about water dragons. 5,000 years ago, the Sumerians spoke of a dragon god named Zu. Another early dragon was Tiamat, said by the Babylonians to have the head and front legs of a lion, wings and hind legs of an eagle, and tail of a snake. Similar creatures were known to the Hananites, Hatites, and Egyptians. Horrible dragon-like creatures called krakens supposedly ran amok on lonely Greek islands more than 2,000 years ago. In order to capture the Golden Fleece, Jason, the Argonaut, left his first sleigh, a seven-headed dragon. Hercules faced and conquered many dragons, including the multi-headed Hydra. Oh, it's good? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I also want to talk to you on break about maybe coming back to talk about some things on the next break, but... Thank you for letting me know, Rob. I really appreciate it. Because I'm here alone just wondering, is it okay? Did I fix it? So the first century Roman natural historian Pliny wrote frequently about dragons, believing them to be giant serpents from India. 
While Westerners perceive dragons as fierce, bloodthirsty creatures to be tracked down and killed. The Chinese generally saw them as good and, in some cases, actually worshipped them. The scaly, fire-snorting fire beasts. By the Middle Ages, winged, fire-belching dragons with forked tails and curving claws were terrorizing castles and villages from Germany to Wales to rid the realm of these fearsome monsters. Heroic young knights like St. George were routinely commissioned by royal families to attack with flaming swords and golden spears. In time, the dragons of old were wiped out. Or were they? Hmm? Legend has it that some of the reptilian beasts survived by burrowing deep into caves and taking to bottomless lakes and rivers. Yeah, what about um, Nessie? You know, is she part dragon? Is she like one of those water dragons? I'm sorry, I'm trying to break this up. Phew. I don't know. Is she a dragon? Is she a sea serpent? Sea serpent locked in the lake because the waters went down. And now she has childrens. Who's to say? I don't know. I'd like to go see it though. From the dark jungles of Africa to remote swamp lands in South Pacific, rumors continue to surface about dragon-like creatures that breathe fire and occasionally take to the air in leathery wings. Some scientists say these reports might be based on sightings of true-life dinosaurs that somehow have survived the natural calamity that wiped out other dinosaurs millions of years ago. Okay, so, in the Four Corners area, the natives have talked about the Thunderbird. I like to call it the Thunder Chicken, even though chickens don't really fly, but Thunderbird. And then I've seen recently videos. I'm glad you're watching, Rob, because I don't feel so alone. But I've seen videos recently of pterodactyl, which before I've spouted out about, okay, in the Four Corners area, there's been sightings of dinosaurs for a long, long time. A la 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 long, a la 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 long, 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 long. There's been pictures of I want to say little bitty, but they're not that little bitty. They're about two feet tall, little baby T-Rexes along the brush line on the roads. Like, people have taken pictures of dinosaurs. Dinosaurs do still exist. And then there's those messed up people that are doing DNA projects where Triceratops. I saw one recently where they have ropes around Triceratops' neck and it's like coming out and it's like, ooh, these freaking humans are bugging me. Why do we have to mess with genetics? Why do we have to make these new, aka old historic things come about again? When in fact they're still here. Like little T-Rexes, pterodactyls, these things are still here. I'd like to see a long neck. If you want to impress me, how about you do a long neck instead of a triceratops? But that's just because I love the land before time and and uh, Littlefoot is my favorite. But seriously, like, let's let nature be what it is because it's so mysterious anyways. You know, we've we've conquered or explored much of the world. Not really so much of the ocean, only 20% of the ocean. Can you imagine what's down there? Pretty sure, even though you think Megalodon does not exist. Oh yeah, that mofo still does exist. Yeah, it's it's pretty intriguing the different things going on, whether it be natural or governmental or scientifically. It's pretty intense. Pretty intense indeed. For example, expeditions to the People's Republic of the Congo, formerly French Congo, yes, because the French had to claim it, have uncovered striking evidence that a family of giant water-dwelling seropods still inhabits the Lokoala, Lokoala swamplands. Ligmies call this creature Mukele Mbembe, one that stops the flow of rivers. Mukele Mbembe 
has been described as about 32 feet in length with smooth reddish brown skin. Eyewitnesses say it has a burly elephant sized body, short, thick legs, a lengthy tail, and a look elongated neck terminating in a small reptilian head. Are we talking about Nessie? Cryptozoologists, scientists who study weird animals, say such descriptions are similar to the famous long-necked Diplodocus or Apatosaurus. Long-necked seropods that romped through the swamp millions of years ago. There may be others lurking elsewhere in dense tropical regions of Africa and the South Pacific, they say. Take New Guinea, for example. The vine-choked swamplands of the South Pacific island are home to some of the world's strangest and most dangerous creatures. Giant snakes, blood-sucking leeches, saltwater crocodiles, head-hunting cannibals, and ven venom-spitting insects. But the most terrifying is the legendary beast the natives of Papo call Matrelia, a gigantic dragon-like monster that supposedly dwells in the trees and feeds on human flesh. Witnesses claim that creatures, said to be more than 30 feet long, swoops down from overhanging branches onto unsuspecting travelers and devours them. Understandably, native pap papayans or Papuans refuse to enter the creature's habitat. Their fear of this creature is very real, concluded one British research team. They have been taught to believe that they are true dragons, and to come upon one in the wild means certain death. During World War II, British and American soldiers stationed in Papau reported seeing giant lizard-like creatures crawling the brush. In 1960, David Marsh, the District Commissioner of Port Moresby, Papau's capital, announced that he had made two similar sightings during the early 1940s. The same year, residents of Karuku or Kuruka, Karuka gave two administration agricultural officers, Lindsey Green and Fred Clinton, the skin and jawbone of what they called a dragon. They, the Artrelia, will lie in the dark, sheltered canopies of tall trees and wait on unwary passerbys, be it wild animals or humans, it matters not, to prey upon. The two officials were told they devour everything, flesh, bones, even the skull, so as to not leave a trace of the victim for the scavengers. So far, no one has captured a 30-foot Australia, but sightings continue. Some cryptozoologists think it is only a matter of time before a giant specimen is found. For centuries, dragon simply meant giant snake. Were then... Did the dragons get its legs and wings and the ability to breathe fire and the habit of living in caves? In the 16th century, Swiss naturalist Conrad Gesner is usually credited for the changes. In a book on the history of serpents, he wrote, They, the dragons, hide themselves in trees, covering their head and letting the other part hang down like a rope. In those trees, they watch until prey comes to eat, then suddenly leaps into his face and digs out his eyes. Well, that's pretty gnarly. Just the thing that nightmares are made of. Some experts suspect dragon legends were inspired by the discovery of giant Komodo dragons. And see, that's what I was thinking when I was first reading this. I'm like, that's definitely a Komodo dragon. Because those, like, mean certain death. There's places where Komodo dragons run rampant. And they kind of put walls up and stuff, so they stay in certain areas. And then humans stay in others. Sorry. I'm trying to get this off me. Um... 
But yeah, there was one such instance where there was a fruit tree on the other side. Somebody reached over to grab one of the fruit and fell into the habitation of where the, these Komodo dragons lived. And they all rushed and they moved pretty fast, kind of like crocodiles or alligators. They moved pretty quickly and they came and they ate that poor guy. I'm like, holy shit, dude. The fruit ain't worth it. Don't do it. Some experts suspect dragon legends were inspired by the discovery of giant Komodo dragons in the East Indies. This creature, the largest living lizard, inhabits parts of Indonesia and grows more than 12 feet long. Discovered in 1912, these colossal carnivores devoured large animals such as deer, pigs, and, on occasion, humans. Well, we are the other other white meat. Some people recently who have been in the heat have reported to me that while I was in the heat, I smelt pork. I'm like, well, well that's kind of sad. Hey, let me try this and get this off me. Holy shnikes. I was getting hot and hung. Nosferatu, Curse of the Dead, is the next chapter. Shortly after arranging for her husband to become Holy Roman Emperor, Empress Maria Theresa, Queen of Hungary and Bohemia, passed a series of new laws aimed at ending an outbreak of vampiritism that had gripped Eastern Europe for more than two decades. The law specifically sought to prohibit the opening of graves and desecration of bodies while generally trying to disprove the existence of legendary creatures known as Nosferatu, dash the undead. These blood-sucking creatures known in Western Europe as vampires roamed the countryside in search of warm flesh and fresh blood. No one was safe from these unholy man-beasts whose lust for human blood was said to be insatiable. In 1746, Dom Augustine Calmet, a respected French theologian and scholar, had caused a sensation when he published a book claiming that vampires were real. He described them as hellish fiends, rose from dank tombs at night to attack humans and domestic cattle. The only way to kill these creatures, he said, was to drive a wooden stake through their hearts. After a brief investigation, however, Maria Theresa determined the claims were false. Vampires did not exist, she said, and warned her subjects to stop digging up suspicious graves. While many in power applauded their empress's bold action, ordinary people, peasants mostly, living in remote mountain villages from Bavaria to Transylvania, continue to seek out and destroy the undead with a vengeance. Legends about the undead go back thousands of years and occur in almost every culture in the world, from Greece to Rome to Japan and the Philippines. Eastern Europeans probably first heard about vampires from travelers returning from the Far East during the 9th and 10th centuries. Over time, these old stories took new forms in places like Russia, Bulgaria, Romania, Serbia, Hungary, Austria, and Germany. Very little was known in Britain about vampires prior to the 18th century. In 1732, however, the same vampire scare that was sweeping through the Balkans got the attention of Parliament which passed laws aimed at protecting citizens from Nosferatu. Thousands of cases were reported in England, France, Germany, and Italy, as well as in the Baltic countries. One sensational story involved a 62-year-old man who supposedly returned 
from the grave to beg for food. When neighbors started dying from loss of blood, people naturally suspected Peter Plagojewicz, a poor farmer thought to have been bitten by a vampire himself shortly before dying of a stroke. Persons destined to become vampires usually include certain noticeable characteristics. Long teeth, reddish eyes, a tail, and a cow. Victims of suicide or sudden unnatural deaths also run the risk of becoming a vampire, as do those who die before they are baptized or are bitten by another vampire. It is likely that these stories and others about vampires and fluists British author Bram Stoker, who, in 1897, immortalized the semi-legendary monster known as Dracula in his classic novel. At the time, few people realized that Mr. Stoker's story was based on a real-life person who lived in Eastern Europe 500 years ago. When I read this story to you guys, um, because we did Bram Stoker's Dracula and we did Frankenstein and such, if you guys haven't heard it, please go back to um, before and listen to those because seriously, reading it and comprehending it, etc. Like, even watching the movie, I just felt like this is real life coming into fictional life. Like, this is real life that they're making into a fictional movie. And I love when they do based on real life stories because I felt like it was real. Prince Vlad Dracula was his name, born around 1430 in the Romanian province of Wallachia in the Transylvania Alps. During his brief but bloody reign, the prince, also known as Vlad Dimbes, was responsible for the murder of more than a hundred thousand people. Can you imagine? That's all. A lot, a lot. His methods of execution were many, but always brutal. Burning, boiling, decapitation, skinning, strangulation, and his per personal favorite, impaling prisoners and criminals on long wooden stakes. Vlad was particularly le uh, fond of mass executions. In order to get the most out of these events, he frequently ordered a banquet table set up in front of his victims so that he could enjoy the sights and sounds of the dying. On one occasion, he invited a large crowd of thieves and beggars to a royal feast at his court in Cherkov... Cherkovist? Cherkovist. As soon as the ragged mob was seated and had begun eating, he ordered the hall boarded up Oh my gosh, this reminds me of a bad section of Game of Thrones or something when they board board up the walls or the doors or whatnot and people can't get out. Oh no. He set the place on fire. See, that's what I'm saying. Same thing. No one escaped the flames. <clears throat> Why would he do this? Maybe they were short on food or something? That is so sick and demented. This only happens on HBO. Just kidding. <laughs> but what the crack, you guys? That's crazy. Defenders of Dracula, which means son of the devil or son of Dracul the dragon, say historians have given the prince a bad rap. His actions were greatly exaggerated or fabricated by political enemies. These people usually point to Dracula's valiant campaign. To have his homeland from invading Turks and his unwavering support of peasants in their struggle against ruthless feudal lords of Eastern Europe as proof of his heroic spirit. Except for that one time that he burned them, you yeah. know. That's different. At least one biographer cites that the prince's generous donations to charity as further proof of his compassionate nature, another maintains that he should be honored rather than scorned because he helped restore order to a land torn apart by foreign invasion and civil strife. <sighs> Most historians, however, conclude that Vlad Dracula was a monster of cruelty, even in an age that bred 
such men as Cesar Borgia and Ivan the Terrible. Dracula supposedly met a violent end in 1476, but there's no historical account of what happened. He may have been assassinated by political rivals or killed by Turks. You never know. What is known is that his severed head was impaled on a stake for public display because, you know, that was one of his favorite things. So how about we do his favorite thing for his death and let's, let's impale his head on a stake and put it along the route there. We'll be right by the gate of, of the church or, or the castle there. What has been dormant for so long? A common fate for tyrants in those days, he was entombed on an island in a lake in Romania. Not long after his death, reports of vampirism became commonplace among rural villagers in Transylvania. Some said the dead prince himself rose from his tomb and might so feed on the blood of the living. While blood-sucking Nosferatu are figments of that fantasy, some researchers believe there might be something more to the old vampire legend than black capes and long fangs. In 1982, a Canadian professor suggested that some people claiming to be vampires were actually victims of iron deficiency. In this condition known as porphyria, porphyria, porphyria. Victims of this disease, dubbed Dracula's disease, Rarely go outside because of a skin disorder that makes sunlight painful. Okay, so my daughter had this when she was a babe, but we mostly ate like pasta and stuff. And then I had to figure out what certain things can she eat that will give her these certain things she don't, she doesn't have. But I don't know, guys. Um, there was another point I was going to make. But on this note, we do have to go to our music break. On this break, we have Miss Mia Savage with her band, Antidote for Savages. And let me pull it up really quick. She is going to be singing Your Skeleton, Your New Reality, Let Me Be Your Home, and Lemurian Crypto. You guys don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this music break.
Welcome back, and thank you so much for joining me tonight on We Are Paradox Media's Late Night in the Rockies. Tonight, it is story time with me, Tessa TNT, and I hope you guys are keeping cool because it's super hot in here. Let me know if you can hear my fan. I think I have my fan on a soluble level where it's not so loud, which would be nice. But if you hear it, I'll turn it off. But holy schnackies, it's so hot. I hope I can keep it on. So let me look back over here, make sure. Let's turn this up just a little louder. There we go. Shapeshifters and were creatures. The notion that people can turn into beasts is not a new one. Prehistoric hunters donned animal skins and held at the moon in order to acquire the stamina of powerful beasts of prey. Shamans, crowned with stag horns, ventured deep inside the caves to commune with dream world spirits that guided men on the hunt. Historic rituals such as these were thought necessary in order to ensure successful chase. Without transforming, without becoming, one of the animal world, hunters might fail in their quest for quarry, thus jeopardize the tribe's survival. Some anthropologists think legends about werewolves, werebears, werelions, and other shapeshifters originated more than 30,000 years ago when Stone Age hunters and shamans transformed into wolves, bears, lions, and elk. Ever since, stories have persisted about monstrous shape-shifting creatures that come out in full moon nights to attack and slaughter unsuspecting humans and domestic animals. These tales about shaggy were-creatures became ingrained in the folklore and mythology of nearly every culture in the world. During the Middle Ages, everybody with pointed ears, prominent teeth, and brushy eyebrows that met over the nose was suspect. Sharp, curvy fingernails and extra body hair were also dead giveaways, as was a long third finger. Oh, mine's not so long. While prehistoric people thought that they could transform into werewolves simply by putting on a pelt, tradition holds that there are many ways to become one of these drooling demons of the night. Most often, the victim is bitten by another shapeshifter or is cursed by a priest. Some become werewolves after tasting human blood, while others are simply born that way. Usually, the seventh son of a seventh son, which, if you know me, I got to see one when I was a baby, they can do some pretty, pretty cool stuff. Another way to become a werewolf is to be born on Christmas Eve. Transformation takes place on full moon nights. Some accounts say that werewolves morph into vampires at death unless special precautions are taken, such as exorcism or decapitation. Well, that's a bit uh, willy-nilly, isn't it? As with vampirism, Cases of werewolf activity have been documented since classical times. In the 5th century BC, Herodotus, the father of history, wrote, Each Niorian, or Niorian changes himself once a year into the form of a wolf, and he continues in that form for several days, after which he resumes his formal shape. Controversial religious texts dating back 2,000 years tell how Christ ordered his followers to stone a pitiful beggar. I can't see that, really, of my brother Jesus to stone somebody because my brother Jesus doesn't judge others. Do not judge lest thou be judged. Like, what? I know, like, when they had that little market in front of the temple where they're selling stuff, he did go off. He had a big, like, hoopla to do about that, but to stone other people? I don't know, I've never, never heard that. To me, that is uncouth. What, what? 
of them. I'm just trying to find my place here real quick. So, as with vampirism, cases of werewolf activity have been documented since classical times. In the 5th century BC, Herodotus, the father of history, yes, I did read that, uh, form of a wolf he continues in that form for several days. Yes, they obeyed, and as their stones fell upon the wretch, he slowly changed into a hideous beast with fiery red eyes, having been the devil in disguise. Okay, so perhaps, like, he's not judging his fellow man, but he knows, like, this is a demon or something that is otherworldly that should not be accepted here. The universal concept of lycanthropy, men turning into animals, played a role in the development of religious sects or religions around the world. The Scandinavian god Odin turned into an eagle. Jupiter, the Roman god, became a bull. Eteion, Eteion was changed into a stag by the Greek goddess Artemis. Goddess Artemis. It is said that St. Patrick once encountered a race of hairy creatures that howled at him like wolves. These people supposedly lived in the woods where they took their food like wolves and turned into shapeshifters every se seventh year. Norse folktales contain references to berserkers, fierce warriors, who wore wolf skins into battle and drank the blood of slaughtered enemies. In India, there are were tigers and were cobras, while Africa has were lions, were hyenas, and were crocodiles. Were bearers once ravaged the Rus Russian countryside. While well, Mexican legends tell of the dreaded Nahal or Nahali, Italians feared the Lupo Monaro, while the French avoided areas said to be haunted by Loup Garou. The best way to avoid becoming a werewolf was to avoid being bitten. Short of that, superstitious peasants of Argentina, Portugal, France, Germany, and elsewhere placed garlic on their doors. Sometimes a silver-bladed knife or pair of silver scissors would offer protection. I've also heard of people... I'm sorry. Man, I don't feel as beautiful as I usually do. But I'm sure so many. Um, but yeah, people would hang like garlic rings above their bed or above their windows or whatnot to protect themselves. I love the smell of garlic. A lot of people don't, but maybe that's a thing. Okay, so the best way to avoid becoming a werewolf to was being to avoid to be bitten. Short of that, superstitious peasants of Argentina, their doors, sometimes a silver blade knife or a pair of silver scissors, would offer protection. Or perhaps, let's say, a silver bullet? Many medieval scholars thought werewolves were minor demons. It was also commonly believed that witches could change into werewolves at will or cause others to transform by casting spells. For almost a quarter of a century, Peter Stubb is said to have terrorized the countryside of the 16th century Germany by donning a magical belt made of wolf skin, giving him by the devil and transforming himself into a giant wolf. Well, that's odd. In 1598, a whole family of werewolves supposedly wreaked havoc on rural western France. These werewolves of St. Claude attacked and killed several people before they were set upon by a mob of villagers and torn apart. Villagers can be pretty nasty, pretty bad indeed. Perhaps the most famous case of alleged lycanthropy occurred in the 17th century France. According to a well-documented uh, account, a man-beast killed dozens of children until it was finally tracked down and slain with silver bullets. That reminds me of the movie that is one of my favorites, Silver Bullet. 
You gotta check it out. One of uh, one of the quarries is in there. Stories about shape shifting were creatures where creatures continue to be whispered in remote parts of the world. In Mexico, isolated villagers often hire shamans and warlocks to protect them from these cunning man killers. In Portugal, people avoid dark forests for fear of running into lobes homams, a particularly horrible shapeshifter that bears the mark of the devil. There's a lot of that going on these days, whether it be like in everyday life, I'm sorry, like I'm kind of melting right now, or in the music world, it's intense. I have to say my husband was making fun of my makeup, but I feel like I'm matching and doing pretty good. I just have like sweat, sweat dripping down into my eyeball, so it's kind of burning and torrent. The next chapter is Into the Unknown. Oh no. This is going to be awesome. Amelia Earhart's Ride into Oblivion. This should be fun. More than six decades ago, after her strange disappearance over the Pacific Ocean, the world still wonders what happened to Amelia Earhart, the perky young gal who was trying to make history by flying around the globe. Sorry, I just saw a sticker. I thought it said sucker, but it was a sticker that said hello. Most inve investigators make history by flying around the globe. Most investigators theorize that her small plane ran out of gas and crashed into the ocean. Other views continue to hold the public's imagination. Some say she was captured and executed by Japanese soldiers. Others believe Earhart and her navigator, Fred Newman, crashed on a remote island and were cannibalized by headhunters. Theories have also been raised that the pair of flyers survived the escape to Europe, where they lived as lovers. Ooh, wouldn't that be nice? The theory I heard was they crashed and got eaten by uh, freaking crabs. Yeah. Thomas E. Devine, who served on the Japanese held island of Seipin, or Seipan, shortly before World War II said he and other American soldiers saw Earhart's Lockheed Electra 10E airplane at the Aslito airfield become something before it was burned by the Navy. What? I don't know. I don't believe this because I've seen evidence otherwise. Okay, hold on. In his book, Eyewitness, The Amelia Earhart Incident, hold on, hold on, where the heck am I? Divine says in Okinawa, women showed him two graves that supposedly contained the remains of a white man and woman who fell from the sky and were executed by Japanese troops. Stories like these have convinced Divine or Davine and many other investigators that the U.S. government knows more about the Earhart case than it will admit. Um, I wouldn't be surprised because they've done that how many times? Jeez, a Pete. So the Navy's stance, he says, is only false and without merit. The facts surrounding the Earhart mystery will never be officially acknowledged by the U.S. government. The latest detective work conducted by the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery has led to a document in London describing a lost collection of weather-beaten bone fragments. The bones were found in 1940 by a British colonial official visiting Nakamaro 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 Island then called Gardner Island an un 
inhabited atoll on the Phoenix Group, about 600 miles north of Samoa and about 400 miles southeast of Howland Island. The destination Earhart never reached. The bones included part of a skull and several long fragments. Have long vanished, but it's commonly believed that they were buried or thrown into the sea or even sent to a medical museum in Fiji. D.W. Hoodless of the Central Medical School of Suva, Fiji, measured them in 1941 before they disappeared. And members of the aircraft recovery group found the late British doctor's record of his measurements in 1998 while searching government archives in London. While Dr. Hoodless and his work needs to be treated with caution, two American forensic scientists who examined his papers knowledge that the bones might be those of Earhart. Not everybody shares that view, however, including Earhart's niece, Amy Kleppner, the 11th grade teacher in Montgomery County, Maryland. I've read everything written and reported about my aunt, Miss Kleppner said in a newspaper interview, and I'm convinced that she and Fred simply ran out of gas within a hundred miles of Howland Island. Amelia Earhart's flight into the unknown began early in the morning of July 1st, 1937, when she and Noonan, a tall, lanky Irishman, climbed aboard her twin-engine Lockhart Electra for what was to be the last leg of their headline making flight around the world. From Leigh, New Guinea, the flight was to take the pair to Howland Island, a tiny Pacific atoll 2,750 miles away. There, they were to establish contact with a U.S. Coast Guard ship that would guide them the rest of the way on their global journey which they would break up in a series of short, leisurely hops. The next day, July 2nd, the Coast Guard ship received the following message from Earhart. Gas is running low. An hour later, she gave a final location report and then disappeared. It was assumed that their plane had simply run out of fuel and crashed into the ocean. But no, it was an island. After days of coming the ocean and hundreds of small islands in the area, a massive air-sea rescue ordered by President Franklin D. Roosevelt was called off. In its official report, the Navy declared that, at about 2300, July 3rd, the plane landed on the sea to the northwest of Howland Island, within 120 miles of the island. As far as the government was concerned, the case was closed, but others didn't want to give up. The plot thickened when rumors began to surface that the U.S. government had sent America's sweetheart to the Pacific to spy on Japanese facilities. Even had they done that, I don't think she would have done that. Not at all. Unwilling to accept the loss of its heroine, the nation held out hope she would be found. Stories circulated for weeks about sightings on lonely atolls and faint radio messages. One message reportedly from Earhart said, on coral southwest of Unknown Island. Richard Gillespie, executive director of the International Recovery Group, recently discovered and recovered airplane fragments that might match Earhart's twin-engine airplane. Gillespie plans to lead a full-scale expedition to Nukumaroro in 2000 to comb the four-mile-long atoll and its lagoon for artifacts and bone fragments. Dr. Tom Crouch, senior curator of the Smithsonian Institution's Air and Space Museum, else anything will be found okay so smithsonian guess what we found giant remnants giants and we've turned that over to you trusting in you the smithsonian museum to keep these artifacts for us to look upon and learn from and no you hide it you hide this stuff so 
to me it's like oh yeah um i really have high faith in you smithsonian museum no you hide stuff from us because the government i don't know what exactly it is but i do not trust you smithsonian museum Dr. Tom Crouch, senior curator of the Smithsonian Institution's Air and Space, doubts anything will be found, I'm sure. The odds are 100 to 1 that Amelia and Fred came to rest on the ocean floor, he was quoted as saying. Ironically, Amelia Earhart's round-the-world flight was to be her last. Before departing Los Angeles on May 21, 1937, she told a friend, We have a feeling that there is just about one more good flight left in my system, and I hope this trip is it. Anyway, when I have finished this job, I mean to give up long-distance stunt flying. That's why you gotta be careful on what you say, because... Your last may indeed be your last. I need to uh, re ointment my lips. It's getting a little dry in here. Alright, so this next chapter is called Hannibal's Crocodiles and Rockefeller. That's a lot. Dutch New Guinea was a wild and remote place in the autumn of 1961 when Michael Clark Rockefeller newly graduated from Harvard University with a degree in banking arrived to film a documentary on native lifestyles. The 1,500 mile long island contained vast explored areas occupied by hundreds of ever warring tribes, many of them cannibalistic and touched by civilization. You should leave them like that. Let them be. But the primitive adventure was nothing new to the 23-year-old son of New York Sharpener and later Vice President Nelson Rockefeller. While in school, the romantic young heir to one of America's greatest fortunes had spent months working on his father's farm in Venezuela before going to Dutch New Guinea to help tape Native Chance. Just gotta make sure I'm doing okay over here. Okay, okay. It was the island's simple, timeless beauty that brought the romantic young banker back the second time in 1961. I see myself in the jungle, he told a friend before running out with his camera to explore the untamed wilderness. Shortly after his arrival, however, he disappeared when his catamaran overturned at the mouth of the muddy Elendary River, near a place that the natives call the Land of the Lapping Death, a reference to an era of mangrove swamps, murky rivers, and crocodile-infested tidal flats. Today, almost four decades after the tragedy, the world still wonders what happened to the young billionaire. Did sharks or ferocious saltwater crocodiles devour him, as some investigators allege, or did he survive the four to seven mile swim to shore, only to be killed and eaten by headhunters? Hard to say. Michael Rockefeller's tragic story began shortly after he graduated from Harvard University and joined an expedition to study little-known tribes in New Guinea's Balim Valley, then under Dutch control. It was rumored that the indigenous people of this valley practiced ritual warfare as well as headhunting and cannibalism. Young Rockefeller paid several visits to the Asmat Coast, where he became enamored of the magnificent wood carvings and fantastically decorated human trophy heads, thinking they would make great collections for his father's museum of primitive art 
from New York, Rockefeller swapped chocolates, silver, and photographs for several of the unusual artifacts. The second week of November, Rockefeller hired René Wassing, 34-year-old Dutch ethnologist and expert on primitive art, to go with him on an expedition up the coast. Local officials tried to warn him that such a trip could be dangerous. Two coastal tribes in the region, the Atsjanep and the Ahmed Esep, were particularly unfriendly. In 1958, Dutch patrolmen had killed several members of their tribes, and they held a blood grudge against all white people. Ignoring the warnings, Rockefeller bought provisions and a 40-foot catamaran from a local Dutchman, then hired a couple of native guides to accompany him to Wasing. On November 18, 1961, the four set sail on the overloaded craft for a village 25 miles down the coast from the mission outpost of Agats. At about 2 p.m., a giant wave swamped their overburdened boat. As the catamaran drifted out to sea, the guides, being sturdy swimmers and familiar with the currents, volunteered to swim ashore and get help. Rockefeller and his Dutch companion agreed to remain with the boat rather than risk the harrowing swim through shark-infested waters. But no help came. Rockefeller and Mossing spent an uncomfortable night being tossed about by the waves. One big wave finally capsized the boat, forcing them to cling to the sides of their lives. Hold on, that doesn't make sense. No, that's what it says. At first light, they thought they saw land and tried to paddle towards it. It was then that Rockefeller, an excellent swimmer, decided he wanted to swim to shore. Wassing, who couldn't swim, begged him to stay. Don't try it, he said. Help will come soon. Nothing to worry about, Rockefeller replied. I'll be fine. He stripped down to his underwear, improvised a flotation device, and swam away. He was never seen again. Wassing was rescued the next day. In the late 1970s, a documentary filmmaker reported that he had talked with a chieftain who claimed that Rockefeller had barely stumbled ashore before he was killed, cooked, and eaten by the natives. I'm sure he was delicious. No, no, no. Milt Macklin, author of The Search for Michael Rockefeller, says a group of Ashtonet speared Rockefeller like a fish, dragged him ashore, killed and ate him. Then they threw what was left of his body into the swamp and the only reminder of Rockefeller that they kept were his glasses, which several re people reported seeing in the village. They too disappeared a few years later. Judge Crater's Strange Disappearance Joseph Force Crater lived the kind of life most men can only dream of. Young, handsome, and rich, the 41-year-old New York lawyer enjoyed the pleasures the world had to offer. Yachts, travel, fast cars, private retreats, and beautiful women. As president of the prestigious Democratic Party Club of Manhattan, he was also very powerful. So powerful, in fact, that in April of 1930, he was appointed to the New York State Supreme Court. In those days, Judge Crater was the most popular man in New York City, ambitious, hardworking, and gifted with persuasive charm and he possessed an uncanny knack for being in the right place at the right time. He quickly became the darling of New York media. Hardly a day went by without his name and picture in the news. 
A bright political career obviously lay before this tall, dapper ladies' man, who parted his iron-gray hair neatly down the middle. All he had to do was stay out of trouble and remember his friends down at Tamari Hall. On the evening of August 6, 1930, less than four months after his appointment to the bench, Judge, Judge Crater disappeared. One minute, he was laughing and talking with friends outside a posh Manhattan restaurant. The next, he waved goodbye, stepped into a cab, and was never seen or heard from again. Judge Crater's ride into oblivion propped in one of the most massive manhunts in New York history. After years of investigative efforts, costing millions of dollars, and covering several states, the fate of Joseph Force Crater remains in an unsolved mystery. Understand the story, it is necessary to go back to that summer in 1930 when Judge Crater and his family were vacationing in their cottage at Belgrade Lakes, Maine. On August 3rd, he told his wife he had to go back to New York for a few days, but he didn't explain why. Three days later, he spent several hours at his courthouse chamber desk going through some old files. That afternoon, he instructed his assistant, Joseph Mara, to cash two checks for him in the amount of $5,150. Later that evening, Judge Crater had dinner with two friends, a lawyer and a showgirl, at a restaurant on West 45th Street. Nothing unusual happened that night, according to the lawyer's testimony, and at ex exactly 9.10 p.m., Judge Crater, dressed in a double-breasted brown suit, gray spats, and a fashionably high collar, waved goodbye to his companions and climbed, climbed inside a waiting taxi. That was the last anybody ever saw of him. When the judge failed to return to his cottage, Mrs. Crater became worried. She contacted his office, and on August 25th day, his court cases were due to come up. Even his law partner suspected something was wrong. As first a private search was conducted to keep the affair out of the newspapers, nothing turned up, however, and on August 26th, the disappearance became front-page news. A police investigation revealed the judge's bank deposit box was empty. Well, that's strange. Empty? As was a private safe and two personal briefcases were missing. Foul play was immediately suspected, though rumors were flying around town that the judge had simply skipped out. Perhaps with a girlfriend he had reportedly been seeing with a, within recent months. A grand jury was quickly convened to get to the bottom of the case. After 95 witnesses had testified and 975 pages of testimony had been amassed, the foreman concluded, The evidence is insufficient to warrant any expression of opinion as to whether Crater was alive or dead, or as to whether he was absent himself voluntarily or is a sufferer from disease in the nature of amnesia or is the victim of crime. In other words, Judge Crater had simply vanished and it would be fruitless to continue the investigation. The judge's distraught widow suspected otherwise. She went on record as saying her husband had been murdered because of his sinister because of a sinister sometime something that was connected with politics. And that's happened so many times, like people get into politics and then they disappear because they have something else to say other than what politics want them to say. Sometimes they get lucky and skip out to other countries, but yeah, they will take you out if you have something more to say than they do. Her main suspect was Tamani Hall itself. It was her opinion that forces he refused to pay them back. Okay. With the... Okay, so it was her opinion that forces within the organization had killed her husband because he refused to pay them back for helping with his nomination to the bench. Other theories linked to the judge's fate to organize crime, some investigators believed 
he was killed after a hotel deal he helped organize went sour. The most likely explanation, according to some, was that the judge was murdered in a showgirl's blackmail scheme, killed by a gangster friend of the girl when he refused to pay their money. On June 6, 1939, almost nine years after he went missing, Judge Crater was declared legally dead. The case was never officially closed and reports about his reappearance continue to pop up more than six decades later. Bum, 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 bum. So our next chapter is D.B. Cooper, Where Are You? And I don't know if you've watched certain movies online, but yeah, supposedly he lived comfortably in the forest and burned money to keep warm and other things that really go against. What? Hold on. Let me see. Well, it shows my sound is bouncing. Oh no. So, Cave says, um, the sound's not going, only the music. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, no. What is that all about? So, let me see what's going on here. Hello, hello, hello. What about now? What about now? Can you hear me now? Man. Well, that's bad. Well, well, that's crazy. So let me see if this is working now. Hello, hello, hello. That's working, but now the music isn't coming through. So Kaveh, thank you so much for letting me know. Um, before it was coming through, I guess on Facebook and stuff, but what the crack? Let me look at my settings again, see if I can fix this what about this one hello no hello hello what the crack Weird. So, I'm not quite sure what is going on with the sound. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I know it's showing up there. Let me look back over here. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Nope, can't hear me. Oh no. Thank you, Kabeh. Weird. Mute. Unmute. So, not sure what's going on with that. Let me go back over here real quick. Okay, so hopefully, Cafe, you can hear me now. But that is so bad. I'm so sorry that happened. Hello, Lorraine. But yeah, I thought because I tested this out before I did the show, I thought it was working just fine, but come to find out it wasn't. So people over supposedly on Facebook Live, etc., couldn't hear me. They could just hear the music. That is so weird. I want to check it again to see. Um. Is the music coming through? Nope, I just see me, but this is what it was. So, can you hear me now? Yep, you couldn't hear me during that, so that is so bad. Anyways, we got it fixed now. Hopefully next break, it'll be better. So on this break, we have Miss Mia Savage and her band Antidote for Savages. And she will be singing, not a phase, singing to your grave, the bottom line as well as, oh, I guess there's only three. That's what it looks like, so. Weird. 
we might have one missing. But anyways, you guys don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this music break.
Welcome back, and thank you so much for joining me this evening on We Are Paradox Media's Late Night in the Rockies. Um, I'm going to mute my video real quick just to see, is my voice coming through? And it appears that it is. Thank goodness that they came through and let me know they could hear the music, but not the ghost story. So those of you that were listening, what the hell? Why didn't you let me know? So, as you know, we did the first two hours with the book that we are looking at, and then the third hour, we do ghost stories from Reddit. Hope you guys are ready for this, because I've been looking and looking and looking, there's all kinds of stuff going on. Pretty unfounded, but here we go. Here is one. I always found the show Celebrity Ghost Stories to be pretty good, especially from people who didn't need the attention. Some of them were really amazing. One that stands out to me was Jerome Sally, who said, after he was in the NBA, he was at a club when someone started shooting. He says he was basically grabbed and ran out the back door. When he turned around to see who had saved him, he saw standing in the doorway was his childhood friend who had been killed a few years earlier smiling at him as the door closed that's pretty intriguing just making sure you can hear me can you hear me can you hear me okay good good we're here prof underscore tout said that's pretty interesting thank you for the wreck hadn't heard of that show before Supposedly, there are a lot of NBA players who have had legit serious experiences at one particular hotel where all they say and they all stay for road games. I can't remember its name offhand, but it's a hotel in Oklahoma City that's pretty well known for being haunted. I'm not sure if any of them have spoken publicly about it, but... As I recall, there are a handful of guys who actually refuse to stay there. 
Bill Simmons, pretty famous sports talking head, stayed there in recentish past and even since he's been on the record saying that he believes in ghosts. At any rate, I've always kind of hoped someone would do a pod series or a documenta series that interviewed all those players when talking to hotel staff. Sorry, my headphones are loud. Kaya Shim said, I was just about to say this. I live in OKC, which is Oklahoma City, and have several friends who have worked at the hotel who can personally attest to some serious strangeness. Plus, the hallway camera caught a creepy encounter with police being called out about a baby crying. Check it out. And then it says, check this out. So you'll have to go to uh, Reddit Ghost Stories and, and check that out. But thank you again, Pave, for oh, saving me in the show. Snoo Calculations 9259 said, I love celebrity ghost stories. The only knock I guess is many of the celebrities, um, they're past their stardom phase. But if it was a marathon, I am planted. Somebody else said, same. And then, hey, many a good said, yeah, I read recommend Telly Savalas's account about him. Meeting a ghost on the road, really credible and entertaining, but you'll have to Google it. So let's go back from this um, and move on to other stuff. What was that? There's stuff falling around in my office right now. And it seems like Reddit ghost stories, like before it was Reddit ghost stories and it was doing certain things and now it's just like kind of intense and people talking to each other and not really doing the whole reddit ghost stories thing I'm trying to find one so this is an image nope not gonna do that one underrated are there any good ghost stories from around disneyland i want to see this one because i've been there and I picked up on some stuff, so I'm wondering, have you guys encountered any ghosts from Disneyland? Are there any good ghost stories from around Disneyland? We're getting back to Disneyland in August, and my son is now at the age where he's pretty obsessed with real ghost stories. Aside from the craziness that goes on inside Haunted Mansion, are there any good ghost stories I should tell him about? When Timely Bird says, Mr. One Way is supposedly a ghost that sits next to single riders on Space Mountain. I've heard of this guy. Thank you. If I were to be alone, I would like Mr. One Way to go with me. He will seem like a regular single rider, and I heard he has red hair. I don't know if it's going to mention that, but just remember, he has red hair. He may even have talked to you in line, but at the end of the ride, after the photo flash, there will be no one sitting next to you. There's a bunch of Disneyland ghost videos on YouTube, as others have said offhand, Disney has several of them, which they do, because different things have happened in Disneyland, and so it's kind of freaky deaky freaky deaky Disney World. I've been a single rider on Space Mountain plenty of times, and I've never met him. What? Am I not good enough for you? You dead jerk! Even he doesn't want to be your partner on Space Mountain, bro. Single rider, Space Mountain Disneyland? Single rider, Space Mountain Disneyland. That pissed me off so much on my last trip. They still have the single rider symbol on the park map for all the old SR lines, even though most of them aren't available anymore. Can't believe he didn't get named Space Ghost. It's right there. And if he's at Orlando also, then he's Space Ghost, coast to coast. Pretty sure he's Space Ghost uh, on the California coast. I don't know. But Kave, thank you so much again. Um, I'm going to... Hello, hello, hello. Yes, you can hear me now. Yay! Thank you, Kave, for letting me know because Jason, um, Robert, nobody else said, Hey, I can't hear you. All I can hear is music. 
Had you not told me, I would not have known, and I would have continued to do the show as such. But thank you so much, Kavei, for conveying that to me, because, seriously, not a good time. So it's crazy because, like, ghost stories on Reddit used to be title, and then you'd read the ghost stories. Now it's just, like, people talking and talking and talking. So I'm just, like, I'm trying to find one where I can just read a ghost story. Spook hospital ghost stories? Just wondering. Nope. That ain't it. Why don't people like ghost story? Real haunted story of a ray... Colony. Let's see what this is. Alright, this looks like a good one. Today, one of my friends told me a paranormal experience her friend experienced in Array Colony recently. Do read and let me know what you guys think and also share your experiences. So, this guy, let's say his name is Aman in his early 20s with traveling from Rare Colony past 12 a.m. alone in his car. Amon took a detour because main road construction is going on in Rare. Suddenly, there was a car in front of him. That car driver was not driving properly and also was not allowing Amon to overtake so he can move forward. Amon honked and tried everything, but the car driver didn't allow him to overtake, and then suddenly a vehicle came from behind and crushed Amon's car from behind. I don't know what the vehicle was, but Amon was shocked and pulled his car on the side. In the meantime, that vehicle sped past him. Amon got out of his car to check the damage, and video called his father to let him know the situation. His father picked up the video call and Amon told him what all happened with him. And then he changed his camera to show his father the car damages. Suddenly, his father asked Amon, who was sitting inside the car? Amon didn't understand, so he asked his father, what are you saying? Amon's father replied, Amon, I saw someone inside the car. Take the camera back towards the passenger seat. I will take the screenshot. Amon's father sent the screenshot. Amon opened the photo, and in the next second, he fell down unconscious, and he is in a coma for the last eight days. That's pretty insane. Can you believe that? What the crack? You fell into a coma because you saw a picture? I am attaching the screenshot, which Amon's father took in the comments. Do share your views on his experience. I don't know if this is real or fake. It's spooky for sure. Who share your array experience less? So this one was by you forward slash sure dash fix f i x dash seven two two six. So if you want to ask him any questions, go there for sure. This is pretty interesting. Aravain fuck your ghost stories. I don't know about you guys, but to me, Oriental, like Chinese, Japanese, um, Filipino, like all these different ghost stories are so much creepier than ours. Just the way they look, the way they administer themselves, it really freaks me out. I'm not going to go into that one because they made a video and I don't have a way to share that from my phone. more videos yes yeah, so I'm gonna have to like go through all this stuff and actually post videos so you guys can see them because oh hey Jason thanks brother for helping me out because seriously like I didn't know like I had different people in here and then they just disappeared and they didn't tell me what the fuck was going on but thank you Jason for helping me out as usual because I would not have known and then I discovered like I try to change stuff around instead of doing that I just needed to go to um, 
where my sound thing was. What is it called? It's called banana something. It's called voice meter banana. So it was uh, on there. I muted myself and I didn't unmute. I did unmute on Spreaker and um, here where I'm broadcasting through Facebook, but Yes, thank you, Jason. You saved my ass, because I'm just reading a whole fucking hour almost, and not even knowing that I'm not making any sound, because people just left. Well, people would come in and leave and, and not say anything, so. Thank you, Jason. I owe you. I could even, like, buy you lunch at McDonald's or something, if you want to. And it's like, I'm going through Reddit ghost stories and it's like people looking for ghost stories. It's like, where are the actual ghost stories? <laughs> ghost stories, recommendations, requests. Can I just find a ghost story again? Where the crack is everyone? Let's check out this one because a lot of people think that ghosts are malicious. I don't think so. Like, the ghost we have here, John, when we moved in, he was here. And he's always been the sweetest guy. Yes, I've seen him. Yes, he's a pretty tall guy. And then my kids have been like, hey, mom, last night there was a ghost trying to work on this system. It's because we quit using natural gas. We don't use the heating system. We just use like a wood fire and so he's sitting there messing with the system and the kids see him and before I even knew what his name was I was calling him John and then thank you Jason thank God thank God I appreciate you um you know, they're like mom there was this old man last night and um Jason I don't know is like right before where your room was there was this little dial on the wall and we took the cover off because we're like trying to look into everything. Oh man, I'm about to sneeze, but um mm, Yep, that was my sneeze. Funny hands. The kids saw John trying to work on the natural gas system where right there by your room is one of the units that will blow stuff and over by the bathroom is another unit. We haven't used those in years. And John's like, what the hell's going on? Why is it so cold in here? It's because we're using wood stoves instead of natural gas. But anyways, come to find out his name was John. And he died from emphysema right here in my bedroom. But So this story is called, We Always Read About Malicious Ghost Stories. What's your friendly ghost story? So Alice Said said, my high school girlfriend was abusing the shit out of me over the phone and had been for hours. It was 2 a.m. I was exhausted. But she kept telling me how fucking worthless and useless and horrible and wrong I was. And something spoke through me. It said, haven't you hurt him enough? And then hung up the phone. According to the psych books and the internet, it was probably a disassociative event. It wasn't unusual in times of stress or trauma, which maybe sounds funny to describe a high school relationship, but this one probably qualified. However, I felt a lot like my grandfather, just the feeling, and the medical explanation probably makes more sense, but thanks, Grandpa. You were right. She had hurt me enough, but I hope to hear someone, someone say, it. Love you and thanks. Deleted said, honestly, this is the most wholesome and beautiful ghost story I've ever heard. I hope things have worked out well for you in relationships since and that they will in the future. You've got your grandpa at your side. Riot underscore ball said, grandpas are the best, dude. They're the best. Tell you what, like, so I had my mom, I had my dad. I wanted to go with my mom this one day, and she said no because she knew she was going to die, and she was planning her own funeral. And she knew, had I gone with her, I would not have survived. 
So my oldest sister and her friend went with her. They survived, but they had broken hips or broken fingers or whatnot. Different skewed things. Um, I would have been broken up more because I was little and more spongy. Oh, sorry if you hear Lily in the background, but she's just having a breakdown. Any news. My mother got hit by a drunk driver. He went to a... There's the women's party and the men's party. He went to the men's party the night before, and he was, like, late on his way to the wedding. He's, like, speeding, gone through. My mom's just, like, pulling out from her house, going to where she's turning off to where our country store was. Our country store was on the certain corner and this guy hit her. And, you know, they probably spun around or whatever. I wasn't there, I don't know. I wasn't allowed to go. And, uh, so they got spun around, everything went askew. My sister had a broken hip. My sister ran to the countryside store, went to the payphone, made a phone call to the people I was with, and to me that was amazing that she knew to do that. She said, we've just been in an accident, you guys need to come now, and she told us where it was, and then she hung up. She doesn't remember running from that accident. She doesn't remember making that phone call, but she did. And it was funny when my mom, I have to share this with you real quick, because this is a preemptive assault. My mom drove me to this place. And the whole time, let me put down the phone. She's holding on to the wheel and she's like, please don't let me die. Please don't let me die. Please let me make it here. So she made it to where she wanted to drop me off. When she dropped me off, instead of going into the house, I went into a car and it was raining and I was just sitting there crying and I was crying for a long time because I knew something bad was wrong. And then all of a sudden the clouds parted, everything was clear. I quit crying. I was like, Shh. feeling better. Then I went to the front door and I opened it up. It was complete and utter fucking chaos. Everybody's like, oh, no. get in the car, get in the car, this and this and that, and that, like things were going crazy. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Come to find out my sister called them. She doesn't even remember doing that. She called them and said, we've been in an accident. Mom's going to die. So they load us up in the car. I just got out of the car. Now I'm getting back in the car. They load us up into the vehicle. We go there. They all get out. They leave me in the car. All I can do is look out the back window and I'm thinking, I just keep feeling like a car is going to hit me. A car is going to hit me from behind. It scared the shit out of me. I didn't really pay attention to what they're doing. I'm like looking in the background. Somebody's going to hit me. Even though this is right down the road from me. There's really not a through a lot of through traffic. I felt like somebody was going to hit me. And then at one point I did get out. And immediately I was told to get back in. But I remember seeing them load my mom into an ambulance. And it was crazy because there was white sheets on the road. My mom was the first to be loaded up. And then there was my sister and Tracy. They were both on pallets on the ground, covered in white blankets. Then they took my sister because she had the broken hip and shit. And then they took Tracy because her finger got cut off somehow. I don't know how, but her finger got cut off. My mom, she like hit the front windshield. I saw the blood splatter on the windshield when I went back to see the wrecked car. My sister got a broken hip. And then Tracy had a finger cut off. These things are very few and far between, like brain damage, broken hip, finger severed. I'd rather be on the finger severed side. But guess what? The guy that hit my mom was the son of an attorney who worked for the state. 
and he had gone that night before and relished and relinquished himself into the guy's party over there for the wedding. Uh, what do they call it? I'm trying to think. I want to say genitals, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, he had a good time that night. He had the greatest time and woke up late and was like, holy shit, I gotta go. I gotta go. I'm gonna be late for this wedding. I'm like, I'm the man of honor. Guess what you did? You fucked up a whole family. My three older siblings and me and my brother, my little brother, went separate ways. Like, you totally tore us apart just because... You drank that night at a bachelor party, and you decided, holy shit, I'm late, I need to go right now. And then you killed my mother. It wasn't immediately, it took like about a week or two, but you did it, and then your dad helped to scrub you off, off the thing there. Oh well, we're gonna wash our hands of this, and we're gonna forgive you, because you're my son, and who gives a fuck about these other five kids and what they're going through? Do you know what? My whole family, only two out of five of us have succeeded as being independent individuals. Me and my brother Greg, we're still here, we're still standing. Yes, we get accused of shit all the time, but we're really good people and we help people and we do the best we fucking can. To help everyone but yeah we got tore apart we got separated we got segregated but eventually we came together but yeah it's intense don't drink and drive is my message please don't do that and I would have thought like my dad he had a drinking issue before but after my mom died very hardcore and then even after that like Oh, I'm going to send you to your grandparents for a vacation or staycation. Guess what? That motherfucker never sent for us again. My Aunt Sandy and Uncle Bill came and got us. And guess what? That's my mom today. She adopted me um, a few years ago. Unfortunately, my Uncle Bill died because of Agent Orange and other things that he was succumbed to as a kid. But my mom... I talked to her earlier and she's my cornerstone. I'm so grateful for her because had she not come and gotten me, I don't know where the fuck I'd be right now. I'd be so lost. I would, like, I don't know. I'm so grateful for her and I'm so grateful you guys are listening. This one is by R Ford slash flicks or you for slash sequestion the story 2017 killed me inside so yesterday i watched a ghost story with casey affleck and rooney mara and just fuck i wouldn't say i'm someone that gets emotionally emotional easily but i'm also not stone cold either I've shed a few tears at movies that kill off likable characters, but for the most part, I can sit through a sad movie without breaking down into tears. A ghost story, however, I could not. At multiple points throughout this movie, I burst into tears, and I'm not even completely sure why. This movie hit me harder than any other movie has emotionally, and I love it. I didn't exactly get it completely besides the general, we all die and life goes on idea, but this was a beautiful movie, and I thought the whole home video kind of feel just added to the appeal. And of course, the ghost subtitles left me laughing out loud. I've had that too, it's like, what the fuck did they just say? Immediately after watching this movie, though, I went to Reddit and surprisingly saw that a good majority of people didn't like this movie at all. What are your guys' thoughts? And so I'm going to read a couple of these. Um, Captain Pajama Pants. Captain Pajama Pants. Said. 
I can understand why people didn't like it, especially if they were expecting a more straightforward narrative. But goddamn, was it good. The two scenes that stood out most in my mind are the destruction of the house, which looked so good, and the party scene with a long monologue. Just did a lot of emotionally with so little, especially when you think about how the main character was a little wearing a giant sheet, and yet the viewer could still emphasize with them so much. And then someone uh, that's called Deleted said, I randomly watched it one day on Amazon Prime. The more I think about it, it might be my favorite movie of 2017. I'm sorry, it's so hot in here. Uh, Greg says, said, I wish there was a better way to word it, but the movie is very haunting. It's stuck with me for weeks. It's so simple, but so effective. My number one of 2017. Sorry, it's so hot. It's hot and melting. Deleted. So why do people do that? Like, they post stuff and then they post deleted. I watched it last night and absolutely loved it. I went in expecting an emotional film, and it was, but I was surprised that I didn't feel as sad as I thought I would. That is until the end when he comes full circle. Watching him watch himself with his girl, knowing everything he's been through and will go through, the barrier holding my emotions in check completely collapsed, and my breath was taken away when I thought about his soul's journey. I can't even feel, fully explain what I was feeling, and I'm still trying to figure out what gripped me so much. But it left its mark on me, and I don't remember a film ever affecting me the way this film did. When it ended, I looked at my sleeping girlfriend and held her before drifting off to sleep. I then went into work and begged my coworkers to watch it just so that I could discuss it with someone. I've never had an interest in these sort of films, but this one, I just connected with. I feel you, brother. There's a lot of stuff like that out there. This is another deleted one. Why do people post things and then delete who they are? Like, are you scared? Are you scared something's going to follow you? Why are you doing this? I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't know. I agree. Great film. This movie really grew on me. At first, I thought I was getting bored with it. But by the end, I couldn't take my eyes off. Then the next thing I know, I'm reading things about. And then I'm watching YouTube videos about it, and I'm thinking about it for days. It really burrowed its way into my brain. It's hard to describe. Meditative, thought-provoking, sad, I don't know. My favorite part is the dilation of time. Times years fly by, uh, fly by in an instance, while other moments stay for uncomfortable long periods. People always talk about the long shots, of course the pie, but I thought it was interesting to contrast the moments that really matter where you can recall every little detail of every little minute versus moments that just happen with no real significance and become large general swaths of memory. Like, if you are single and don't really do anything fun for a month and just work for uh, money or go to school, all those memories turn into one fast-paced blob. But an evening spent with someone you care about and its significance to you. You care about and is significant to you. You can relive every second. To me, the bed scene and the pie scene are indicative of this. He's watching his wife grieving his death in that uh, in total agony and can't do anything to help her. That's a huge moment that's seared into him. So I think the ultra long take represents the significance of that moment to him. With any of you, 
haven't seen David Lowry's, the director's, interview on it, you should watch. Gives me some good insight. So that's pretty intriguing. Oh, Smack Weasel. Smack Weasel! What's up, Smack Weasel, De Weasel? I love a slow burn and I appreciate the patience it displayed and what it was trying to do. The story did nothing for me. That pie scene was just too indulgent for my taste. Sequizion said, Fair enough, I do agree with the pie scene. I get what they were going for, but I felt like they could have done were gone about it in a better way than just Rooney Mara eating a pie for five minutes uninterrupted. I don't know how long it takes me to eat a pie, but it could take five minutes. Summon underscore the underscore bitches said, I liked it, but I went into it thinking that it wasn't going to be good and I almost stopped watching it. The long shots and the lack of dialogue make it hard to watch at times. Talent Pun said, If you ever watch it again, imagine. Asterix. You're watching it from Casey Affleck's point of view, through the tiny eyes of a ghost, witnessing his life the second time. Asterix. That the ghost in the neighboring house is another viewer, just like you. Waiting for something to happen. Something that will make sense of it all. Some kind of closure. When that ghost says, I don't think they're coming, and disappears, that's like another person giving up on the movie. The reason why the pie scene is so long is that it really underscores how painful it would be to be trapped in a place and time without any real power to affect your surroundings or circumstance. Rubber Duck Me says, Definitely one of my favorites. Lingering shots were just in the beginning. Dow44 said, My favorite of 2017 too. It seems that Reddit likes this haunting movie after all. So question OP says, Yeah, it surprised me how this sub's opinions seem to be complete opposite of R4 slash movies. Anyways, let's get away from this one. Let's try to find another one. Ooh, Ring Wraiths in M.R. James's Ghost Stories. This is by you forward slash Dark Rolling Waters. Last night, I read an old ghost story called Oh, Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad by M.R. James. I didn't sleep well after that, and I imagine I detected a distant echo of the Black Riders and the ghost itself. I wondered if we have any information about Tolkien's attitude to James's work, or ghost stories in general. This particular story was published in 1902. Although I have not seen any adaptations, I understand that the one film version replaces the whistle in the story with a ring. I've been trying to work out what elements in it made me think of the ring rates. One, I think, is simply the sheer terror of being in the presence of the writers. Another is the cloaks which give form to their nothingness. A third is their inability to see our world. Most of all, is their airy mode of moving. Swaying, crawling, crouching. Perhaps, James or James's creation of a brooding atmosphere through weather and landscape is also a point of similarity, or the way the whistle, with its quality of infinite distance, calls to nothing or something from the depths of time. I don't want to ruin the old ghost story for anyone who hasn't read it, so I've tried to spoil the quotes below. They perhaps highlight a little bit of what I felt rather than saw. And by the way, I highly recommend it from Halloween. It's free to read online in Gutterberg. And oh my gosh, when I scroll down, it's all blacked out. Like, what the fuck? Why is it all blacked out? 
Oh, that is so creepy. Why does the government do that? I don't know, you guys. That is so freaking weird. So this one is saying RPGs that can do ghost stories. This is by U4 slash James Everington. So J-A-M-E-S capital E-V-E-R-I-N-G-T-O-N. So I'm a fiction writer in the UK. Small slash indie press horror scene. I sometimes do panels, etc. at conventions. Next year at the UK Ghost Story Con as well as my usual author shit. I've also somehow been invited to run a session on running PTRPGs to tell ghost stories. So I'm interested in game systems I might not be aware of that fit the bill. I already have a list, but sure, it's incomplete. Just to be clear, I'm not really looking for games like D&D, which have ghosts as just another monster to beat up with magic swords, but games that can with feature scenarios like actual ghost stories, traditional or otherwise. Um, why won't it let me like it? Weird. Kel Astrophy says, you should probably tell us what's on your list. Otherwise, you'll probably get a bunch of the same suggestions that said you probably haven't heard of Campfire don't know this one. Very interesting. Sorry, I didn't want to post the list initially as I wanted to gauge in a very unscientific way what ones were popular, not just ones new to me. But you're right. I have not heard of this one. Thank you. Salut. Project Slack. So it's spelled P-R-O-G-E-K-T. Capital T-H-R-A-K. Wraith? The Oblivion, uh, oblivion or Geist, the Sin Eaters, in the former, you play as ghosts who struggle to persist in a cruel underworld, and in the latter, you play a dead, then return to life person who could interact with ghosts and the under- underworld. Sully5443 says, you might want to look into the between as well as its amazing Weird West hack, Ghosts of El Paso, which happens to be drive through deal of the day as I'm making this comment. Though do be advised, you'll need a copy of the between as well as given Ghosts of El Paso is complete, but not with all the baseline rules that are laid out in the in-between. Both games are excellent and have amazing emergent storylining or storytelling for resolving dark and mysterious threats. Ghost of El Paso, as the name suggests, leans much harder into the spooky side of ghosts, whereas the between hits all sorts of dark and spooky things from ghosts to demons to serial killers and more. I think serial killers are supernatural too because they're fucking freaky as hell. This comment goes into further detail on the between, specifically, and some of its amazing supplementary material and some anecdotal advice from running the game myself. Neither are truly perfect for one shots, con play, but they are still both very serviceable. Arcbound Hero says Dread or Monster of the Week might work. And then Nightmare696 says, I was fully expecting, and I'm quite surprised that this thread is not just 30 people correctly suggesting dread, and one guy insisting that you try G-U-R-P-S, all capitals. Sorry, it's so hot in here. The Altoids Esther, or the Altoids Eater, sorry. You should try chill. Um, let's go to another story because we only have a little bit of time. What? How is Ghost Stories with two players? I've heard nothing but good things about this game, and I'm not looking for games, so I'm going to pass on that one. Ooh! 
Good horror story set in Victorian era. This is by U forward slash Eddie Baby 17. So E D D Y B A B Y 17. Like the title states, books set during the 19th century. So if you guys have any 19th century horror stories, feel free to share that with Eddie Baby. Man, Reddit ghost stories right now for me. As far as I can generally look and just get ghost stories immediately, this is not working. Ooh, I'm gonna see what this one is. Dram Stroker's Dracula, Drood, Dan Simmons, Hyde, Daniel Levine, The Seance, John Harwood, From Hell, Alan Moore. From Hell was so good. Do not always like Alan Moore. Oh, sorry, my chair is broken. Um, as I find him, hit or miss. But man, when he hit, there is no one else like him. Nervous Tumbleweed said, check out his take on Lovecraft, the courtyard, and the Neonomicon, and Providence. The Providence on him is... You guys can check that out later. My dad's ghost story. I finally found one! That is a fucking ghost story. Jeez, so cute. This one is by you forward slash... Marv and ORV249. My dad's ghost story. I first heard the story when I was in college. I had come home for winter break, and I remember it was just me and my dad in the house. I was watching some kind of ghost hunters program on TV just for laughs. I don't really believe in that stuff. When you watch the programs on TV, they're just so oblivious and obviously fake. It's too hard for me to let go of my preconceptions and just watch and try to get into it. My dad was the same way, so I thought, he didn't seem interested in the paranormal or anything. He was the kind of guy who would scoff at anything supernatural. The program I was watching flip to a commercial and I casually got up and found my dad in the kitchen. So out of the blue, I asked him, Hey dad, do you believe in ghosts? Yep. His reply was so casual, it shocked me. Really? I asked. Hold on. Yep. So I asked a bit, taken aback, like, it just doesn't really seem like you. He shrugged his shoulders and mulled over what I had just said. Yeah, he replied eventually, but I know ghosts are real. I've met one. Upon hearing this statement, I had to know the story. You can see, my dad is like me. He likes to tell stories could retell most of his stories from memory just uh, because he would tell them so frequently to anyone who would listen. Yet, here was a story I'd never heard of an event that changed my dad's life. To this day, I don't know if I believe it or not, but when someone who is so influential in your life, someone who seems so logical and so down to earth tells you something like this. It calls into question what you believe and why. Though he never brings it up, when I talk to him about it, he swears it's completely true. No exaggeration and no doubt in his mind about what happened. Here it is, told from his point of view. Hoping I get through this since before we have to go back. I was working the house in Tacoma, where you grew up until you were about four. My parents still live in the house, but I was going to college. I was back visiting them for the weekend. I was just over at Tacoma Community College, so it wasn't far away. I came back often to visit and get a home-cooked meal. I remember that I was sitting down for dinner with my parents, just the three of us. It was in the late spring, early summer season, so it hadn't really gotten dark. Yet, we're talking like normal when the phone rang in the kitchen. My mom got up and answered the phone leaving my dad and me in the room together alone. After a short while, she called to my uh, dad and called him into the kitchen as well. 
Neo, can you come in the kitchen here for a moment? I remember she seemed worried. Her voice was shaking a bit. My dad wiped his face, got up, and joined my mom in the kitchen. They weren't in there for long, but they were talking quietly and felt strange. After a few moments, they came out of the kitchen. They had their coats on now. Something's come up and we have to go out for a bit, my mom said. There's dessert in the fridge. Help yourself. Don't worry about the dishes. I'll wash them when I get back. My dad said nothing, but I could tell from his face that it was serious. My mom looked genuinely worried. They were out the door in a flash, and I was left to finish the dinner at the table. I cleared the table and washed my plate, despite my mom's instructions. Then I went into the main room to read. I was down on the sofa and opened one of my school books and began to relax. Hours went by and my parents still hadn't come back. It was now around 11 o'clock and I was just about to read and get ready for bed. I walked up the stairs, making my way to the bathroom when I had heard a strange noise. I paused and listened for a while. It was the ceiling. The ceiling was making a slow, drawn out whining noise. The wood was creaking gently. It wasn't an unusual sound, but there was an unusual rhythm to it that made me uncomfortable and curious. After listening a while, I pulled down the steps to the attic and listened a bit more. I could hear the sound more clearly now, along with the metallic creaking noise. I gathered up my courage and decided to investigate. I climbed the steps. Now I have to say I wasn't scared. I didn't have an uneasy feeling. Actually, it was the contrary. I felt quite comfortable, even though it was...